Sally YouTube and welcome Kleena to the Not Even French channel. Hello. <laughs> oh, I'm really excited for today's video topic. So this is something that I haven't really done before on this channel, but I wanted to start connecting with expats, francophiles, people to deep dive on French culture, French attitudes, life in France and that kind of stuff. And this topic is going to be something that's dear to my heart and something that I know so many women and men probably struggle with when they get to France. It's very particular. It's all about body image. So Kleena, tell us a little bit about how you became an expert in this space. So um, I work as a, a body confidence coach and basically that means I help people with their body image. So I help them to accept their bodies, love their bodies and basically get comfortable with the things we're not comfortable with. So it all started um, a year and a half ago now. Um, I started working with expats and like helping people to, you know, settle here, make friends, do all that jazz. Mm. But everyone kept coming to me with the same things. And it was about their body image once they moved here and feeling like they were too fat and um, not stylish enough. And um, they like stuck out. They felt too big. They felt too small. Mm. Acne, hair falling out. All these things that happen when you move to Paris. And the hair falling out yeah. thing has to do with hard water, but it happens anyway. Yeah, that, um, yeah. by the way, it's not just the stress of moving to Paris, it's actually yeah. something in the water that makes your hair thin and it's like just really difficult to wash your hair in Paris and it goes yeah. all dry and brittle and breaky, yes. Yeah. It's like dull and, oh, it's awful. But anyway, um, so people kept coming to me about these things and I had already been through my own body confidence journey and one that was like massively impacted by Paris. And over time I was like, okay, I need to like change what I'm doing because people are really struggling with their body image here and it's something that I can help with. My mm -hmm. business like naturally developed into body confidence and I like had already been qualified, I'd already got my qualifications to do what I do, but I started mm -hmm. to learn further about body image and also looking at it from an expat's point of view. So, but that that's how I got into like doing it for other people and now I'm doing like one-on-one -on -one sessions and I do workshops in Paris and I do all sorts of like fun projects like the next one I'm doing is like a body positive painting one where we're like painting our bodies and taking photographs and things um, oh wow yeah so like doing fun things like this with it um but my own my own journey has been a bit crazy in itself I um had like a an ex-boyfriend a French boyfriend back when I lived in Dublin mm. and uh we used to come over all the time to Paris and that's when I, at the tender age of 19 going on 20, started to notice that there was a lot more body, like pressure around the topic of body image here. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure you've seen it yourself too, when there's this pressure to be very slim, particularly as yeah. a woman. Yeah. It's there for the guys too, like let's be honest, yeah. but particularly yeah. for women it's there. Um, and I remember I came back from my first time visiting Paris and I was back in Dublin and I had heard a lot of people talking about bodies and cellulite and saying really negative things. Like um, mm. there was a friend of my boyfriend who was saying that like basically everyone had to be very slim. Um, and then he was putting pressure on his girlfriend at the time to also get a boob job. And it was outrageous. But when you're really mm. young, these things just go in and you don't really think about it. And I remember mm. I went on this like crazy diet when I went back to Dublin and I was trying to like fit into the French beauty ideal, even though I didn't live here. Um, mm. But when I moved here years later, I was like, uh, no thanks. <laughs> and was better prepared to handle basically what happens here. And I think mm. a lot of people really struggle with body image when they first come here. Um, I, I, have you experienced that too? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, in New Zealand, I was always quite petite. I'm, I'm short um, on this like smaller side of being a human, you know, just a, 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 a short and smaller kind of person. Um, and I arrived in Paris and I was always the chubby girl in the office compared to the, my colleagues, you know, and suddenly I became hyper aware of how I looked. Um, and it was this weird thing where I'd go back to New Zealand and and people would say, oh, you're so petite, you're so slim, you're so, you know, and I'd be in Paris and I'd be the big girl. Um, yeah. Even though, yeah, compared to being absolutely on the smaller side at normal in my, in, in my country that has a real bell curve of weights um, and then going to Paris and being in the, in the situation where people are slim and not just slim, but strict around what they eat, when they eat 
how they eat and there's this culture around self-control like I can have two bites of my dessert and leave it you know I, yes. I never saw a French girl binge I never saw it like you know that sort of sleepover with your girlfriends binging on chocolate and lollies and tippies like I didn't see that and um that kind of food as a treat and that kind of all that stuff was different um and it's I I haven't quite settled on you know for good or for bad I think I'm leaning towards um you know it, it probably does more harm than good I think I, I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, your experience in working with people, what happens to them when they are confronted with these ideals and this culture and how they feel about themselves. I think the mental health and the pressure you're putting on yourself, both as a French woman and not, must be enormous. Oh, it's enormous. Like, I, it was the same for me. Like When I came up from Ireland, I was not considered like the slim one, but I was like, you know, normal. And then I came here and I was suddenly big. Mm. And that change that messes with your identity too, because we all identify as things um, for whatever reason. So when you're suddenly being told, no, you aren't this thing you thought you were, you're something else, you have a little bit of an identity crisis. You're like, what? Like, I thought I was good and now I'm being told I'm not. What's well, this? I've got a problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like no one told me. Because even when I first came here in my first job, I had, um, I had to go see a doctor. You're supposed to do that when you start a new job in France. And the doctor, um, the first thing she said to me when I entered her office was like, take your top off. Mm. And I was like, maybe I've misunderstood this. Um, you want me to take my top off? And she's like, yeah, take your top off. And then mm. she told me I was too fat and that I needed to like lose a huge amount of weight, like an amount of weight that would make me severely underweight for my body frame and everything. And mm. I remember just being like, huh, yeah, right, whatever. And thankfully, I already felt good in myself. So I was able to leave that thinking that's silly but mm. when um if for other people when you have something like a doctor saying to you you're far too big you need to lose a ridiculous amount of weight or you need to start like applying these rules that your colleagues are doing or french mm. people are doing because that's how french women stay slim all mm. these things it can trigger stuff inside of us it can trigger us to start disordered eating which is different from an eating disorder. Disordered eating mm. is when you like limit yourself, you create these like strict rules that <laughs> they're sometimes based on what you think is healthy or logical, but a lot of the time it isn't. Like I can't have cake after six o'clock or do you know things like this? Mm. Mm. Yeah. So I found that too, like when I came here, when I used to come here on trips all the time, I noticed that all the women I met would do really funny things when they were eating that I, I found peculiar. Um, like eating really tiny amounts of things. And like you said, like mm. leaving, having two bites of a dessert and not touching it. Mm. And I just didn't really get it. I was like, mm. why are you holding yourselves back, ladies? Go for it. Like, yeah. have some fun. Eat, <laughs> Eat the, the cake. Damn cake. Yeah. <laughs> Eat the cake. Um, You're in France. Then, like, it's just, a, it's, it's such a paradox, this food. And then the diet is just like, oh. It makes no sense. And it puts people under such pressure. And also when you move here from abroad, you want to eat all the cakes. You want to try the pastries. You want to do this stuff. And then you're being told, yeah, exactly. And then you're being told, oh, well, actually no one eats that. <laughs> That's just <Yeah>. decorative. <laughs> I, I remember that um, at work when I was at LVMH. So quite a luxury company, you know, group and well, the number one luxury group in the world quite a luxury group like you know and so you can imagine the kind of people working there um let's say society elite often had you know came from very noble french families um high achievers looking very chic very um very emily in paris vibes with the you know the, oh. <laughs> the office culture oh, yeah. that's a whole nother thing um and i remember you know every day because you'd eat lunch together which is a really positive of, of French culture, not eating lunch quickly at your desk. Um, but therefore you'd people would see how much you'd eat, what you'd eat, and etc. Et and I would always take like the mousse au chocolat or the pastry or the because Paris, like come on guys. <laughs> you have um, to. And I remember my French boss kind of pulling me aside actually and saying to me, Rosie, just so you know, like when you know French people eat desserts, it's like a piece of fruit or some yogurt. Like you don't, like with desserts with every meal, she's like, you don't always need to get the cake. You know, you don't always need to get the pastry. Like she's just like giving it to me as kind of um, almost motherly advice, you know? 
um, which was strange for me in, in a professional context. Oh no, man. See, that, that's the problem. This kind of stuff is normal here mm. and it shouldn't be because saying to someone, don't eat the cake, you can only have this or this as a dessert, that's not okay. Like mm. there is this thing and what I'm going to say is very controversial and I'm sure a lot of people would be like, that's not true. That's not fresh. That's okay. We do, we do controversial. <laughs> <laughs> this whole thing in France of we're so concerned about everyone being slim and, you know, we eat this way to stay thin. Mm. It's really fat phobic. And it's, it's portrayed as if it's a thing about health. But the truth is health can exist at all sizes. So when you're telling people you can't eat mousse, you can only have this or that as if they're concerned about your health. It's not that they're concerned about health. It's, it's fat phobia. Mm. And I've seen a lot of fat phobia here in Paris. Um, mm. One time, the most shocking thing I ever, I ever witnessed, and I'm very proud of how I reacted to it. Maybe it was a little bit immature, but I'm still proud of it. Um, I was in the supermarket one day and there was this voluptuous woman who I thought was beautiful. And she was just doing her food shopping, like just, you know, doing normal stuff. And there was this elderly woman who like stood and stared at her and was like, oh, and looking at her in disgust and kept looking at her up and down, had her like jaw hanging, looking around mm. to get other people's reactions. And I saw her doing this and the woman who was shopping, um, the voluptuous woman, thankfully didn't notice it, but I did. And I went over mm. to the woman who was being judgmental and I did the exact same thing back to her. I looked her up and down and I was like, oh, I'm doing this whole thing, I'm so disgusted. Yeah, and she dropped the act and walked away, and probably mm. said something rude to me. But I had my music in, so I didn't hear. But mm. I remember just thinking, like, what gives you the right to be disgusted and judging of someone in that way? And mm. I've heard, I've had people tell me about people taking like desserts and things out of their trolley when they're shopping and replacing it with other items. There's been lots of stuff like this that happens. So like mm. when you're an expat and you're not used to any of that in your own country and you come mm. here and you witness it or you have someone say something to you like don't eat the dessert or the doctor telling me I'm too chubby or whatever it is, that can really impact you massively. Mm. And then the longer... Oh yeah, God. God. I was just going to no. say uh, like when a medical professional steps in as well because that is like, you know... They know their stuff and everything, but the doctors in France are still French and they um, are quite biased. And uh, one, of, one of my good friends went through pregnancy in France and um, there was this obsession around how much weight she gained by medical staff. Um, so the rule is nine kilos, nine months maximum cannot gain more than nine kilos. If you think about a baby being like 3.5 kilos, the amniotic sac, the placenta. So, you know, that means the woman's gaining four to five kilos in nine months of pregnancy. And that'd be, she'd be like measured. And, you know, if she had gained five kilos after four months of pregnancy, they'd say that she was um, putting her baby at risk of gestational diabetes. Um, that was, there was all this kind of stuff going on. And I honestly found it quite cruel. Um, and it's just such a, I've told, woman back here in New Zealand about that and they're just like jaw to the floor like that is disgusting like pregnancy is already difficult enough let alone like you having to be on diets and like not like where's the line between not feeding your baby like not 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 feeding your baby I don't want to add more judgment to it like you know I know yeah. I know pregnant women and mothers can't win sometimes but oh my gosh like in New Zealand the normal amount is around 15 kilos so I, I wonder why in France it's six kilos less as the recommendation of how much to gain but that's always just an average right depending on your body type depending on how you carry weight depending on all sorts of things it should be a bell curve and I just found it so strange how a very tiny pe pe petite woman could only gain maximum nine kilos for a nine-month pregnancy um it just it kind of and and that's the and I had a colleague going through it as well and yeah eating incredibly you know arms like this incredibly small salads etc and so now these tiny 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 women with a big um you know pregnant stomach and it just looks a bit off you know when they're it's like their body looks like it's on a diet and you know and they're pregnant I found that quite interesting as well so I think it's important for expats in France to know that the doctors are in on it as well it's definitely a societal cultural thing um and yeah, yeah I'd love to ask your opinion on 
where where is this coming from? Do you think it is heavily influenced by the fashion industry, by the beauty industry, or what's going on here? Oh, it's it's all of those things. It's the beauty, fashion, diet. It's all of it coming in together. Because mm. by telling people you need to lose weight, you need to look a certain way, you need to be a certain way, you can sell them products. Like, mm. for example, cellulite was never an issue until I forget his name, but it was actually a French man who said, Cellulite's the problem, ladies. Buy my cream to sort it out. Mm. And that's when cellulite became an issue, even though 90% of women have it. So all of this pressure that's put on us, it's to get us to buy things, to do things, to behave a certain way, because mm. we're sold the idea that if we're slim and beautiful and as close as possible to perfect, then we'll live these like shiny lives where everything is like so much brighter and happier and amazing. And I used to fall for that. And it's mm. not anyone's fault when they fall for these things, we're tricked into it. For years, I thought if I was really slim, that my life would just somehow be so much better. And that's when I would start truly living my life once I left yeah. a certain way. Yeah. So yeah. it comes back to all these things. It's diet culture, it's beauty culture. Um, but also with fashion, it's hard too, because if you're really into fashion and you don't fit a certain body type, you don't mm. fit into fashion. So like, for example, mm. even for me, I'm not, I'm not large in any way. I'm, I'm, quite an average body sh size and shape but I find it really hard to buy clothes in Paris in general mm. and oh, yeah. I would be like probably judged heavily if I went into any of these designer stores and I was like I would like a whatever and they'd probably mm. be like this is not um, for you not that. <laughs> yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. And they'd be like mm, hey oh. Jim's over there <laughs> I have had I have had such experiences with shopping in, in France like finding jeans I couldn't I had to oh, get stop. because I because I'm pear shaped, so I'm sort of like smaller up top, but I have a like bigger bum and thighs, let's say. Um, I could not find jeans in Paris anywhere. And the jeans that I would like try on for my for my height and my size, um, they often had like butt padding in them. And I was like, I don't need more butt. Like, so it's it's also hard for for the for the the petite woman in France because they'll put on their jeans like and and, and they need to have a round butt as well. So you better like pad the jeans. I found that really funny. And when it, when I went boot shopping, I've talk, talked about this on this channel before. Um, to get you know sort of knee high boots for the winter, I couldn't zip them up. They wouldn't go up my thighs. I mean, my my calves. Yeah. So yeah, that was like that was so confronting and so humiliating. And Isn't at the time, I mean, like in all transparency, we're talking about like, you know, a 55 kilo woman. Like it's not, do you know what I mean? It's not like, oh, shock, you know, shock and awe. And I couldn't get the boots up. So, you know, it was just sort of like you have to be low 50s, 40s to fit the clothes. But that's the problem. Like in France, there's the idea that we're supposed to fit clothes. But that's not how it works. Clothes are supposed to fit us, not the other way around. Why are we trying to like, you know, change our body shapes and change ourselves to fit into clothes? Like it's fabric, it's leather, it's whatever. Make it so it fits us. Make it so that we can find places where we can buy things that fit us. Even buying a bra here is so hard. I like buy mm. most of my clothes when I go home to Ireland. I haven't been home to Ireland because of the pandemic. So like, I really need to go shopping but like there's, there's things like underwear and stuff mm. tights oh my god I can't I okay this one evening I really wanted a pair of tights that were like skin colored and I bought the largest pair that I could find in the supermarket Monoprix and when I brought them home the tights were tight on me in the point that I had stretched them out as far as they would go and I had never put a pair of something like tights that's elastic on my body and filled it out to a point that like that was it yeah <laughs> it was, yeah this is your xl See, this makes no sense and i'm like a yeah. european is 42 like that makes mm. no sense yeah so you're gonna feel yeah. shit you know like when when you come here and you're curvaceous or you're tall or you're whatever it's so hard to buy clothes and then you start mm. to think i'm the problem because everyone's telling you you should be eating less you should be doing this you should be doing that you you start to compare yourself to other people around you and yeah. thinking well they look like this or they look like that 
maybe I need to be more like that. And that's when it gets into our heads and we start finding issues with ourselves and disliking ourselves. And I know you recently did a video about Emily in Paris. And that was one of the things that annoyed me about that series. And I I did enjoy the series, don't get me wrong, but she was already the French beauty ideal. Yeah, and I found yeah. really unrealistic. She was like, yeah, she was yeah, exactly. Like as an American, she was representing the USA and looked like a French girl. Yeah, and she I was like, thin, no, no. long brown hair, not dyed, not coloured, and like yeah, apart from what she wore, but yeah, absolutely, she was the French beauty ideal. Like every French person would be calling her beautiful, and yet yeah, what about the the expats who arrive who aren't? beautiful to that to that standard absolutely I completely agree and there's going to be people I'm sure in the comment section on this video talking about the health perspective it's just not healthy to be bigger you're at higher risk for heart disease you're at higher risk for xyz let's talk about that a little bit I'd love to hear your thoughts on that because I remember walking around Paris and seeing some girls walking around that were so thin that if they were in out of context if they were in New Zealand people would have been like sort of saying, oh, poor darling, she must have anorexia. I hope she gets better soon. Like people would be really feeling sorry for her, like very, very thin, um, which was completely accepted and acceptable. Um, And then, you know, the smoking culture as well. So I'm like, how is very thin um, quite obsessed or quite controlled with food, smoking and not really exercising a lot because energy levels are probably quite low at that size how is that health versus you know maybe a bigger woman who's working out five times a week doing her steps like do you know what I mean so I like I found this very very difficult to wrap my head around I'd love to hear your thoughts on it oh yeah and it, this one is a great this is a great question because it actually it comes back to the fat phobia thing again mm. because we cannot judge a person's health by how they look no matter how hard we try or what we think we can you know perceive from the outside we can't tell there's no way to fully measure health but the thing about health is and it's been proven recently health can exist at all sizes so you can be like you can be like me you could be a curvy lady you know cooking healthy things and going for your run and doing whatever but someone might look at me on the street and be like oh, she's not healthy, because they just Mm. look at me and presume something. And Mm. the thing is, being really thin doesn't mean you're healthy. Being overweight doesn't mean you're not healthy. And we have to stop thinking in this way that the word thin and health are interchangeable, and the Mm. word fat and unhealthy are interchangeable. It doesn't Mm. actually work that way. It's it's something we've been told by the diet industries Mm -hmm. that's incorrect we've just been told it so we believed it but it's really not correct and again you could be like someone who's really slim and smoking never exercising haven't eaten a vegetable in like two years maybe on the brink of having scurvy but people will think you're healthy just because you look a certain way so yeah really there's no way to we, we need to stop judging people on this and stop thinking that thin is one thing and fat is another it's just not how it works. It's a misconception we all have. And we just have to just all put up our hands and be like, you know what? We were wrong. I was wrong. I used to think this too. We're all wrong about this and we can't judge it. And particularly France is a very good example because you can have very slim people that are smoking and doing all these things and are Mm. beautiful from the outside, but may not necessarily be living the most healthy lifestyle. And Mm. that's okay. Everyone can live their life how they want. Mm-hmm. Um, but we need to stop treating people who are heavier as if they're not worthy of things or that they've done something wrong by being heavier or that they're not being healthy. It's, um, it's wrong. And it's fat phobic mm. by thinking of people who would look a certain way be- or don't deserve to be treated as well. Mm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And so, I mean, I'm sure, I mean, when you're doing coaching with your clients, it's it's quite an extensive process, but can you give us a, a small insight into some things that people can do to start falling back in love with their body or to change their mindset around the way that they're viewing themselves? Where, where do you start? What kind of things do you take your clients through just to give us an idea? So everyone is like a little bit different. So everyone's going to have their own things depending on their own experiences the body that they have, their feelings towards their body, their gender, all these things. Um, 
usually the first thing I do is I get them to start off. every single person I see if you for anyone that comes to my workshops or does whatever it always starts with the same thing and it's very simple I get people to start smiling at themselves when they see themselves now this might sound ridiculous and for a lot of people particularly when you're in France smiling seems like it's a bit of a no-no so <laughs> you're not the smile um, but what I get people to do is to look at their reflection and smile and the thing is, even if it's a fake smile, a forced smile, it doesn't matter because when we smile, it releases serotonin. So we feel good. So when you see yourself and you're brushing your teeth or you're like just putting on your makeup or you're walking on the street and you see a reflection in the storefront, smile. It will release serotonin. You'll be looking at yourself. And over time, you'll start associate seeing yourself with feeling good. So even mm -hmm. when you forget the smile, it's going to make you feel good. And this can be a little bit of a, a trick, let's say, and you might feel like it's not being honest, but it's the first thing that can get you to see looking at yourself as a positive thing. And then from there, there's so many different things we work on. Like I will help people with um, stopping to compare themselves to other people mm -hmm. and communicating towards themselves differently. Like a lot of us can be in a bad habit of, again, going back to the mirror. You see yourself and you're like, I need to lose weight. I need to do this. I need to do my eyebrows. I need, oh, I look tired. <laughs> and we start to like mm. find all these flaws. Mm. Instead to look at ourselves and be like, you know what? My eyes are gorgeous this morning. Or, you know, mm. instead of like feeling bad about your tummy being like, oh, my tummy is so cuddly and soft and all these things. And then also looking at how we communicate. So communicating about ourselves, but also how we communicate about others. We can all get into a bad habit of communicating badly about other people's appearances, which actually makes us feel bad. Yeah. It makes everyone else around us feel bad too. Yeah. So I'm a big believer in that. I think if you, yeah, we have to do better as well in female culture of, of like calling each other out if that's happening, because it just, it, it's actually a reflection of how we feel about ourselves. And it's the most insecure girls I know are the most judgmental and picking flaws in other women. Um, and it definitely starts there. And I think it just comes from a place of, um, but then it makes you think that people are saying those things about you constantly. Exactly. So, yeah. You need to get yeah. out of that loop because when we get into this loop of like, we say bad things about people, then we think other people are saying that about us and it goes on and on and on. And the reality mm. of the situation is, People don't really think about other people that much. You might feel mm. like people are judging you and thinking about you, but in the, everyone's like living their own life and thinking about, well, tonight, what am I going to cook for dinner? Or I need to do this for work. No one is mm. really spending like 10 hours a day thinking, oh, like Rosie looks like this or Kleena looks like that. Like no one mm. cares. Um, so it's getting our heads around that. And then I also do a lot of work regards getting comfortable with what makes us uncomfortable. For example, if someone's uncomfortable with their tummy, they often won't really touch it or look at it or do any of these things. So I often get people to do exercises where they actually look at that part of their body, do stuff like massage it, become comfortable with it. Oh, yeah, there's so many different things I do with clients, but like, it mm. depends on what the, mm. the issue is. You know? It depends on what's bothering them, what's upsetting them, what, what makes them feel like they, they can't do certain things in their lives. For example, though mm. someone might feel like they can't go to the beach because they don't look the right way and it's helping them get past that so they can go and enjoy their lives and do the things they want to do. Yeah, so, absolutely. So so yeah. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much for sharing all of these more tangible aspects, because I know personally as a career coach, when we said the word coach, you know, people are like, what, like, what do you do? What do you mean? So, so it helps to make it more tangible with people that it's essentially, you know, an assessment of where you're at, where you want to be, how you want to feel, and then um, testing and experimenting a lot of different techniques and science-based and psychology-based methodologies along the way to get you to where you want to be. So yeah, in a nutshell. <laughs> in a nutshell, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, where's the best place to find you on the internet if people watching this are interested in what you have to offer and maybe even working with a body confidence coach themselves? Yes, yeah, so you can find me. Um, I have a website, which is my name. It's cleanaburn.com. And then through there, you can book. I do like 30 minute free calls where you can talk about all the stuff that's going on that you want to like sort out and, you know, mm. feel good about. Um, I'm also on like social media. I'm on Instagram as Cleaner the Coach. And I post a lot there about 
stuff regards how to feel good about your body and stuff about boobs and all sorts of things. So I'm also there too. Love some boob um, content. I love a bit of boob content. Um, and I do coaching on Zoom and I also do workshops in person. And every month I do a different workshop regards different topics and different things. So I'm around. <laughs> cool, perfect. Well, we'll link everything in the description box down below as well. And I'm really looking forward to seeing people's comments on, on this video, reactions, thoughts, feelings. Um, yeah, um, if you're on YouTube, feel free to jump in and respond to some of the comments as well. I think it's going to be a really interesting discussion that we start having. Um, yeah, I've wanted to do a topic on this for a while. I'm glad that I have an expert to, to you know, have that perspective on because I felt a bit confused in my mind about how to tackle this topic because it's very real and very true for expats living in France. So thank you so much for being here. Thank and you. yeah, and to the people watching, we'll say a bientôt.